welcome to Destiny Worship Center where you matter. We're so excited you took the time to worship with us today. Please take the time to share, like, and subscribe with our family and friends. Also, if you have any prayer requests, let us know via the chat box. As we continue our 21 day fast and we're believing God for some amazing testimonies. If you would like to partner with Destiny financially, uh, as we continue to do kingdom work, you can do uh, you can do that in wonderful ways. Give me five. Destiny Worship Center, Lancaster, Texas. Cash out. Dollar sign Destiny. WCC. Uh, two. Our website www.dwccc.org. Or you can drop off at the church uh, from 11 a.m. to 12:30 p.m. Now God bless the hearers of His Word today. Bless the songs that may be lifted up to you with praise and worship. And the sermon brought to you. We're excited about what you have in store for our future. In Jesus' name, amen. God has 
winter storm and like we said before we know in spite of the adversity in spite of the hardship we serve an amazing God that will see us through this like he has seen us through so much before gospel of Mark the the eighth chapter and in your quiet time I invite you to read the entire chapter because it is a good chapter on uh, being able to see what others don't see. Before experience, you say we're going to take a few verses, verses 22 through 26. And it reads as such. They came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes, he put his hands on him, said, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Jesus and his, his boys come to Bethsaida and it says that when he get there, some people, no, nobody ever take but just some people brought a blind man and they begged Jesus, just, just touch him, just put your hands on him because we know when you touch him, something has to happen. And he takes this blind man and he leads him outside of the city and he spits on his eyes, put his hands on him and said, what can you see? Do you see anything. Man said, I, I see something, but I don't see everything. So Jesus puts his hands on him again. And when he touched him the second time, his eyes were open and his sight was restored. Jesus sent him home and said, don't even go back where you came from. I, I want to use for a subject from a song that is very popular that my grandmama used to sing. I once was blind but now I see. Uh -huh. But I want to put something at the end of it again. I once was blind, but now I see again. I once was blind, but now I see again. When we, we find ourselves in today's uh, preaching pericope and we meet Jesus having to deal with the debilitating disease of blindness. And if you look at it on its surface, you would think that he's just talking about one man. And yet it's not isolated to this nameless man as it is highlighted in our given text. But we look at the beginning of chapter 8 and we see Jesus dealing with this disease of blindness from the beginning. We look at this miracle that is the lesser known, lesser talked about 
feeding of the 4,000, not the 5,000, but the 4,000. And Jesus says, I love these people too much. They've been with me for three days. I can't just send them away because if I send them away, they may not make it back home. The disciples say, where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed all these people? And that question would have made sense before Mark 6, but in Mark 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000. And yet here we find ourselves in Mark 8, and he's trying to feed a lower number, and the disciples still don't know who Jesus is. The correct statement would have been, well, let's find out what we got. Jesus, you do your praying thing like you did the night before, and we're going to feed these folks. And yet they still find themselves struggling to understand who Jesus is. And so the disciples, his disciples, connected to Jesus, saw miracles, leaders in the church, and they are still, still blind. And then after that, it, it goes on to say that the Pharisees, the, the teachers of the law, the religious leaders of that day, the ones who were supposed to know the Messiah when they saw him, sought out to question him, to, to test him, to try to trip him up. And they said, give us a sign, a sign from heaven that we may see and believe and know you are who you say you are. And Jesus says, ain't nobody giving you no sign because the sign is sitting right in front of you and you're still can't see him doing all the religious rituals and praying and fasting and reading the scriptures and they are still blind. Looking at what you're looking for and you're still blind. And then if you go a little bit further after Eve dropped that on the conversation the disciples are having an exasperated Jesus finally says do you still not see? Do you still not understand? Catch it, because blindness doesn't just come for the sinner. It doesn't just come for the one born with it. It can happen to anyone. And so God sent me on assignment to tell someone that your experience with God is often determined by your expectation of God, and your expectation of God is often rooted in your revelation of God. Please don't miss it. Your experience with God it's often determined by your expectation of God. And your expectation of God is deeply rooted in your revelation of God. In other words, do you see God the way that you need to see him for him to be the God that he needs to be in your life? Okay, let me make it plain. Let me make it plain. Um, I was shopping with my kids. And my son is old enough to know simple math. So he's, he's in a of a great hour they are adding and multiplying and so he also has a concept of you can only buy what you can afford so now he's starting to look at prices and starting to say like okay well well daddy i got twenty dollars a week i can buy this and i can buy this but i can't buy that and so my son is now starting to be intimately aware that uh that money matters so when we go to fast food he will he'll ask is this a, a dollar menu trip or is this a regular menu trip because he understands there's some things you can get on the dollar menu that you can't get on the regular menu because he understands. He understands money. He understands money. Uh, money matters. Uh, but my baby girl, uh, uh, but it, it, it don't matter how much it costs. In her mind, it's not a question of if daddy can get it, but when he gets it because I asked for it. In her mind, I'm going to ask for it because I have an expectation that because I asked for it, my daddy is going to get it simply because, catch it, because I asked for it. Okay, you, you, you missed it. My son tries to stay within my budget because he understands monetary constraints because life has taught him in such a way that you can't get everything that you asked for. So his expectation level used to be here and life has a way of bringing it down because you can't just get everything that you, that you asked for. So he, and, and he also connects what he asked for, what he's done recently, because if I, if I haven't done the right thing, and I haven't cleaned my room, and if I've been mean to my sister, maybe it'll impact how my, my daddy will give me certain things. And so he, he has now started to expect differently based on what he thinks I have budgetary and what he thinks he's done in his behavior. But my daughter doesn't care about a budget, don't care what she's done, if she asks for it, she
She expects it, not because of her, but because of her daddy. Could it be that God can't bless you the way that he wants to bless you, not because he can't, but you don't expect him to? Not only do you not expect him to, but when you look at yourself and all that you've done and all the mistakes that you've made, your experience with you impacts the ass of God. So you have bad expectations of God and bad experience with yourself, and it is causing you to miss being in the fullness of God. Uh -huh. Let me help somebody today. Please listen closely. Um, you aren't qualified. You aren't worthy. You aren't good enough. You're not saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit enough. There is nothing that you can do or warrant to give God adequate <laughs> permission to bless you the way that he wants to. Please listen carefully. God knew you before you were you and still decided to make you. So God is not intimidated by you and it does not impact how he wants to bless you. Could it be the reason why you aren't blessed the way that you are supposed to be blessed? It's not because God don't want to bless you. You don't know how to ask for it. Because his word says that I want to bless you exceedingly and abundantly. More than you can ask or think. The problem is some of you ask and think too small. Selling for a man and not a godly husband. Cool with a chick that isn't a Proverbs 31 wife. And you do, you good with just passing and not magna cum laude. You've just been living with small and comfortable with less and dealing with mediocre and God is saying you don't have to. But you don't believe you're worth it. And because you can't see you the way God sees you, you won't ask of God because you ain't really seen God. And so there's some people under the sound of my voice in this room and in the chat, much like the disciples, you're suffering from being blind. So the text says that we find this man who has gotten comfortable we're being blind. Because the text says he was brought to Jesus by some friends of his. And, and the friends are the ones, the text says, who begged Jesus to, to touch him. Um, the Bible says he had a crew that had to, at the very least, figure out where Jesus was going to be. Because the Bible says they had just gotten to that Satan. Which means that they had to hear about Jesus going to this area to even meet him there. So you got a crew that had to figure out where Jesus was, then get you to agree to being in the journey to get to Jesus. And then when they get you there, it's not even you that ask for healing. It's the friend that say, Jesus, will you please just, just touch him? Could have taken that man anywhere. Could have left him where he was. And it says that they took him to Jesus. Um, some years back, um, I've been in education for a while, but, for, but some years back I was a PE teacher. And you see a little bit of everything um, um, as a PE teacher, particularly when you don't have a gym, you got a blacktop. So for all the people that, that, that grew up in schools where you didn't have a gym to play in, you had to go outside on a blacktop, you always knew something was going to happen where somebody scraped the knee, elbow, finger, something on the blacktop. The blacktop is undefeated when it comes to scrapes and, and, and nicks and, and cuts. And so there was this particular time. And I was standing outside and we were getting ready to come in. And I had two girls bring this other girl up to me. And I said, well, what y'all want me? We ain't about to go in yet because don't nobody come to you when it's recess. Because it's recess, they doing their own thing. And so I'm looking at why they at. In, 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 my, in my vicinity, in my presence, and they said, well, hey, she fell while we were playing hide and seek, and she scraped her knee, and we bring her to you. And I said, why'd you bring her to me? They said, well, all we could do is look at her. We at least figured you had that red uh, first aid kit, so you could at least put some of that spray stuff on it and put a Band-Aid on it. And they were right, in and of themselves, all they can do is look and say, dang, that sucks. You, you scraped to me. Dang, you bleeding. That's crazy. I'm not bleeding, but you bleeding. Dang. But they knew if they brought, him, brought her to me, to my presence, they didn't know what I could do, but they had an idea that maybe I could do something to help her out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Do you have people who know where to take you when you lose something they can't give you? In other words, do you have friends that can take you to the one who can restore you when they can't restore you and all they can do is remind you of the fact that you don't have what you used to have? Come close. There are too many people right now under the sound of my voice who have friends that are content to remind you, dang, he, he, you know, he wasn't no good, girl. Dang, you know, you shouldn't be in a house, but that's crazy because you're still in an apartment. Dang, that's crazy that you have to ride the bus still, particularly in all this cold weather. I would hate to have to ride the bus. You don't have friends that can take you to where you need to be. You just have people reminding you of the fact that you have lost something. Too often we settle for sympathy when we need a circle of surrogates. Okay, uh, a surrogate by definition is someone who carries something for you when you can't carry it for yourself. Somewhere, this, this, this man, this nameless man, gave up on the hope that he would ever see again. And it wasn't his faith that led him to having his sight restored. It, it was the faith of his surrogates. It was the, the faith of those that carried him into the presence of Jesus. It was the faith of the surrogates, the one who begged Jesus, please, if you do anything, just touch him, just put your hands on him. They believed for him when he couldn't believe for him. Self. He couldn't believe, but they could. He wouldn't believe, but they, they would. How many people can be honest with yourself that the fact that you are still here listening to me preach this sermon, sitting in this room right now, having given God worship, wouldn't be here not because of you, but for the fact that you had a surrogate who carried you when you couldn't carry yourself. I had a grandmother that was praying for me when I didn't even know who I was. I had a mom who was praying for me when I didn't want to know who I was. I had a father who was praying for me when I decided to leave the house and not look back. It had nothing to do with church. I had people praying for me in such a way that I am standing here not because of my faith but because of surrogates. When your faith is gone, who? Who's your surrogate? When your hope is gone, who? Who's your surrogate? When your, your trust is gone, who is your, your surrogate? When you've lost your joy and your peace and your perspective on life, who is your surrogate? Some of us are suffering right now because you think you got to carry yourself by yourself, but God told me to tell someone, you need a surrogate. So the reason why Jesus came and bled and died because he knew humanity needed a because without it, we couldn't get to him. We, we wouldn't get to him. We would be lost. And God said, I'll send my son as a surrogate to carry sin that humanity is not fit to carry. So that was good. I thought it was good because this man didn't even initiate the process of him getting healed. It was a surrogate that he had in his life. And, and, and yet, the, the text says something interesting. Uh, it was the friend's who brought him to Jesus to touch him. But Jesus didn't heal him in the presence of his friends. Look, look, look at the text. The text says that when, when they brought him to Jesus and begged of Jesus, please just touch him, Jesus responds, then he didn't say anything to the friends, he didn't say anything to the man, he just grabbed him by the hand and led him outside the village. text says, he leads him outside the village, spits on his eyes. text says that when they were alone, outside the village, Jesus begins the process of healing. When, when the friends brought him, Jesus took him. And it wasn't until they were alone that the process of restoration could begin. When it was time to heal, he was alone. When it was time to recover, he was alone. When it was time to believe again, he was alone. Well, what are you trying to say? A surrogate can carry you there. But there comes a time where you have to stand with Jesus alone. Could, could, could it 
be that the reason why you have not grown and recovered and gotten your sight restored is because you like company more than you like the cocoon. Okay, uh, be, be, before a caterpillar can, can walk or fly in the fullness of who it is and what it was created to be, it goes through a cocoon season where it can't be with the other caterpillars. It has to get by itself because it's only in that place that it's able to get what it never had. Please don't miss this. You thought you were in a lonely season, but God was just trying to get you alone. And some of you right now under the sound of my voice have been struggling with this season because it feels like you've been quarantined not just because of a pandemic, but because of your purpose. And you walk around the house frustrated and stagnated and, and irritated, trying to figure out why is it that it seems like I can't find peace? Why does it seem like I can't find joy? Why, why does it seem like everything is frustrating me? And you keep going to people and places and, and things and trying to figure out what it is. And God is saying, you keep going to places instead of getting by yourself. I can't grow you because you like company too much. Every time you get frustrated, you get on the phone or you go on social media and you post and how you feel it. Because God can't wrestle with you until you decide to let him have you. It wasn't until Jacob got by himself, he had a whole caravan with him, but when God got him by himself, he was able to wrestle with him in such a way that he said, not only did I give you a new name, now I can give you a new identity. There's some people here right now frustrated, and God is saying, it's not that I don't want to change you and restore you and revive you and renew you. I just can't get close to you. You have to ask yourself the question, what is distracting me? What is preventing me? What is keeping me from getting alone with God? Is it my husband? Is it my wife? Is it my kids? Is it my job? What, what is it? Is it sports? Is it, is it depression? What, what is it that's keeping me from my cocoon season? What is it that's keeping me from being able to wrestle with God in such a way that he can restore all the things that I've lost. So this man didn't put himself in a cocoon, his friends did, but when, when they did, when he got alone, the text says, Jesus spits on his eyes. I don't even have time to deal with the fact that Jesus spitting on his eyes. At least the other man got Jesus spitting in the mud and then putting the mud on his eyes. But this man got Jesus spitting directly on his eyes. I'm going to tell me, and can I see? I don't know Jesus. I still got spit in my face. <laughs> but Jesus asked the man, can you see? And the man said, I, I see people. I can see people but they look like trees walking around. I know you did something because I felt something wet hit my face. And you're asking me a question saying, can I see? And I can see better than I did before. But, but it's not quite how it used to be. In, in other words, Jesus spit and it didn't work. He, he spit and he was still partially blind. I, I, I don't know about you, when I read it, I was confused because at least, at least the man that got to spit in the mud, when he washed it off, he could see. But this time, Jesus spit directly on the man's face as he can he see, and the man said, yes and no. In other words, Jesus, why even spit if it wasn't going to heal him? You by yourself, so you don't have a point to prove. You, you're not doing this in front of the audience. It's still or just, it's just you and this man, so I spit. And it wasn't going to heal him. Uh, God, God, God told me to, to relate to someone. He, he, he wasn't just healing his eyes. He was trying to heal his heart. 
And in, in order to know if your heart has been fully healed, I need to know if you can be honest. Catch it, because he would have missed the completion of his miracle if he wasn't honest about his condition. Had he told Jesus, you spit on my, yes, I can see, I, I, I can see again, Jesus, Jesus, thank you, I can see people and they're, they're walking, it's amazing. Had he not been honest with Jesus about his condition, he would have lived his life with the partial blessing of God and not the complete blessing of God. How many people have been putting on for God and just coming in his house saying, I, I'm so excited to be here. I, I'm so blessed and highly favored. All the while on the inside, you still hurt. On the inside, you're still broken. Wondering how it'll look when you give him all of the mess and all of the hurt and 
all of the brokenness. What will God think of me when I give him that? All he wants to do is touch you again. That's all, that, that's all the text says. He didn't tell the man, how come you can't see my life? Why didn't the spirit work? All the text says that he touched him again. God needs to know, I know, I know you're still hurting. I just want to touch you. Again, I know you may be confused. I just want to touch you again. I, I know, I know you got some internal bleeding. I just want to touch you again. I know, I know that you don't know if you can trust me or not. I, I just want to touch you again. I know this pandemic and this storm again, and I know all of it has you wondering how can God let bad stuff happen to good people? I just want to touch you again. He just wants to touch you. Again, I, I'm done. I, I'm done. Um, I, I thought this was about uh, this man's sight being restored. I, I thought this was about him getting his, his vision. And the text says he got his sight back. He can see everything clearly. Got his sight back. He can see everything clearly. It, it, it was confirmed for me that he lost what he once had. Because when he was talking to Jesus through the, the miracle process, he said, I see people and it looks like trees walking around. But how would he know what a tree looks like if he could if he was blind from birth, which means he, he had it, and he lost it. Had it, lost it. Had it, lost it, catch it, and didn't think he would ever get it again. If you don't hear anything else, please hear this. Uh, oftentimes, because the enemy cannot steal your gift, he will try to steal your vision. The enemy cannot take what God created you to do, but he can take the perspective of you thinking that God will ever do it through you. And there are a lot of people under the sound of my voice that still have giftings and you just lost perspective. So many of us not walking in the power of our purpose, paralyzed, not because we lost power, but because we lost perspective. We stop thinking that we can do it through us. So my, my question for someone today is what, what, what caused you to lose your perspective? Was it your age like Abraham? Did you think that what God told you years before wasn't going to be able to come to for which is why you try to rush the process by doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing. And is, that, is that true? Did you, did you think that God put an age on what he wanted to do through you and in you to, to the point where you, you just thought, yeah, it wasn't going to happen. And because God can't do it for me, I got to do it for myself. And you find yourself birthing things that you were never meant, never meant to birth. Could it, could it be in mistakes? How many Peters are in the house that said, I, God, Jesus, for you, for you I live and for you I die. God, I will die here for you. And yet when it comes time, you, you deny them with your, your words or your, your actions or your choices and decisions. And you, you find yourself like Peter saying, God, I know what he said about me. I know he called me the rock, but why would he ever want a weak rock like me? So you lost your perspective because of the mistakes that you made. But just like Peter, Jesus went and found him. And he didn't say, why did you deny me? He didn't say, I'm disappointed. All he said is, do you love me? Because the thing that can restore perspective is realizing that God still loves you. He still loves you. And you love to in spite of your failures. So how many of you right now 
feel like you failed God. You feel like you let him down. And because you let him down, he can't use nobody like you. And since he can't use nobody like you, what's the point of having vision? Well, why would God want to take me anywhere? And if I'm not going anywhere, what's the point of me saying anything? Because the only reason I have sight and vision is if I'm going somewhere where I need it. And since I'm not going anywhere, I, I, must, not, I must not need it. If you're anything like me, you've been in that place where you can't see, not because you can't see, but because you don't want to see. But there's a reason why Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And in me, there is no darkness. So if you are under the sound of my voice right now and you are in Christ, you can't be in darkness because light and darkness cannot coexist. And because Jesus is the light of the world, he has come so that you might have vision. He just wants to know if you'll let him touch you again. He just wants to know if you can trust him enough with all of the mess and all the mistakes enough to say, I, I know I've been in church and I know I've been saved and I've been baptized and I know I've been to Bible study and I know I should know better, but God, I still can't see. I know I should be able to see, but I still can't see. What I should see is still blurry and I still can't make it out like I should be able to make it out. And so God is saying, enough not to be angry with you but just to, to touch you again because if you can fight the enemy's voice long enough to realize that God knew you before you knew you that he's not intimidated by you nor is he ashamed of you he just wants to be there for you. You, like the songwriter once penned, can say, I once was blind, but now I see again. God, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you that this mic doesn't keep me from blind moments. And so if I've had my blind moments, I know that there are others under the sound of my voice still walking around in darkness that they put themselves in. So God, I pray right now that you will be light in their life. Remind them that you don't want to, uh, to embarrass them. You just want to touch them again. You just, you just want to embrace them. Sometimes the first touch is just to see if you'll be honest enough to say, God, I need another one. God, I need you to touch me again. God, that first one was good, but I, I, I want to live in great. I want to live in the overflow of your blessing. God, God I don't want to put you on a budget. God, I want to live in the overflow. God, touch me again.
to earth, suffer, bled, and died, and rose three days later just for me. I believe you stay high now and look low. And that you have great things in store for my life. If you believe that, if you receive you are even that, we believe that you are saved and we welcome you to the body of believers. Here at Death Works, Restore with